director uh, at the German Historical Institute, uh, taught for a long time at the University of Minnesota, uh, and then was Max Weber chair at the uh, Max uh, at at NYU, Computers uh, Institution. Uh, and uh, is currently involved uh, uh, at the Georg, or is currently at the Georg Eckert Institute in Braunschweig, uh, uh, where she is heading a research uh, area on globalization and world society. Uh, she is uh, certainly known to all German historians in Europe and the United States. Uh, by her book on the Miracle Years, Cultural History of West Germany, 1949-1968, which is no doubt one of the most successful uh, books uh, published over the last 20 years uh, in, um, in the United States. And uh, I, I wish the same fate to uh, another book, uh, which is simply interesting for the title and for what she is talking uh, about today, is, uh, that is the Dacian Europe and the, uh, uh, and the World Textbooks and Curricula in Transition, which uh, she edited together with Yasemin Soisal. Uh, this is all I want to say here. Uh, uh, I could say much more, uh, but uh, I have much more, but there we are. Uh, Elazar Barkhan uh, is uh, from Brandeis University, uh, where uh, he received a PhD in Comparative European History. Uh, he is currently Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. So that is in itself an interesting and su suggestive title, and uh, serves as a co-director of the Human Rights Concentration at the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, his very important books, uh, which I think everyone has read, uh, The Guilt of Nations, Restitution and Negotiating Historical Injustices, uh, then perhaps lesser known but equally important, Claiming the Stones, Naming the Bones, and uh, last but not least, Taking Wrong Seriously, Apologies and Reconciliations. Our commentator will be Deepesh Chakrabarty, who needs no introduction and will not get an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> his name is not Dipesh Chakrabarty, his name is Provincializing Europe. <laughs> <laughs> well, my research assistant who put this together uh, in the first version actually had... say that name of Kautsky once? <laughs> <laughs> my, my research assistant had the Italian version of <laughs> <laughs> Provincializare. <laughs> Europa. That sounds so much better. We will leave it at that and uh, uh, start with Hannah. Yeah, I, this is a tough act to follow, the interesting debates of the morning and the afternoon, but I try my best to keep you awake. Um, so what I want to do in the next 20 minutes or so is first to address the context of history textbooks in a more general manner. I will then second turn to contention over textbooks as it unfolded in the Federal Republic of Germany. And finally, I will outline uh, what would be, in my view, a responsible design for knowledge acquisition in public education in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, many of the points that I'm going to discuss will resonate with the debates that we had in the morning and in the afternoon, especially when it comes to Europe and um, the, the question of nation. So first, some brief remarks <coughs> on, the textbook, uh, on the context of history textbooks. Education has been one of the most important tools in the short but determined career of the nation state as the organizer of collectives. Historically, subjects were transformed into citizens through the teaching of history, geography, and the language of the nation. People were anchored in illustrious paths in particular territories and in the grammar of national self-recognition and the logic of collective reassurance. Thus, to quote Eugene Weber, peasants were turned into Frenchmen, Bavarians, Hessians, or Westphalians were turned into Germans, the English, Scots, and the Welsh were turned into Britons, and the Irish, Germans, Mexicans, and Chinese into Americans, and obviously I could go on. While it is true 
that historiography and the nation state traditionally have had an intimate relationship, this is particularly true for school historiography. As Alida Asman has shown in the 18th and 19th centuries, schooling for the general public and state control of curricula and textbooks were part of the process of nation building and the creation of social cohesion in the interest of the emerging industrial society. Academic historians everywhere have enthusiastically entered the service of the nation state, thus creating and legitimizing national narrative, narratives. In the process of shaping the nation state, state books did in turn, indeed turn into weapons of mass instruction to aid the process and fight anything that would challenge this consolidation. The container model of national history has powerfully marked boundaries and has given meaning to all kinds of issues. It has provided and continues to do so orientation on who belongs and who does not. In so doing, the nation state has since its inception shown its Janus faced character, oscillating between the ethnocentric blood and soil characteristics and its modern civility. During the last third of the 20th century, however, we have experienced a thorough deconstruction of national history, and I guess everybody who is in this room has, been, has taken, played an active role in this process. The deconstruction of the national, nar national narrative that focused on social classes, groups, genders, ethnicities, and locales is here to stay, being supplemented by a growing awareness to the issues of a globalizing, wor globalizing world, the need to understand its complexities, be these the economic exchange on a worldwide level, the transnational character of politics and communication, competing memories after the end of the Cold War, and the growing importance of post-colonial narrative, be this transnational migration and its transforming impact on host societies, or any number of world historical topics that are gaining in importance and urgency. Having said this, the role of the nation state in a globalizing world needs to be thought about in new ways, something which goes beyond the scope of this presentation. But this much can be said. The steady expansion of institutions of mass education throughout the 20th century even in regions of the world where ideological and material sources pose a severe hindrance to its implementation, is an indicator of nation states' dedication to the idea of forging collective meaning and establishing common values through education to this day. And actually John Mayer and his group in Stanford have done a lot of research on these um, uh, Equalizing, equalizing tendencies all over the world. And I'm not going into this, although they are very interesting uh, points that they have been uh, put forward. Also, national history continues to be history by default practically everywhere. Historical accounts nowadays tend to transcend the national narrative and embra embrace broader historical perspectives. From a world historical perspective, nation states and their needs for the narration of their origins are but a short moment in history. They have been the pre-modern formations of empires and vast territories without nations. Charles, you alluded to these kind of greater empires and it's, it's um, their, their particular um, tension with, with the project of the nation states. And there have also been the frequently futile attempts at identifying nations with modern state formations, conflating ethnicity and statehood. Until today, we have the growing influence of transnational units or even world historical developments that relativize and question the logic of nation states and at the same time reconfirm essential elements of the nation state among which education is not the least important. This brings me to my second point, the contention of a textbook as it has unfolded in the Federal Republic. 
In Germany, after 1945, the occupation powers made sure that the textbooks were cleansed of poisonous nationalistic ideas in different ways in West and in East Germany. Germans subsequent, subsequently picked up the thread. There was contain, contention over textbooks, and I will just name a few issues in the Federal Republic, neg neglecting debates in the GDR, because that would really go probably too far. In the 1950s, the question really was, what does it take to be a democratic society? So the way people did it, they hooked on to the democratic traditions in German history, and that um, um, played out in a particular interest uh, in the Weimar Republic. This is, of course, was a very indirect way of dealing with the Nazi past. It was so indirect that my generation hardly learned anything in school about Nazism, a silence that only uh, broke in the 60s when the, post, when the first post-war generation came of age. Then, in the 60s, the Auschwitz trials and the student unrest brought the Nazi past onto the agenda, in public debate as much as eventually also in school curricula and in textbooks. And ever since, we have variations of the coming to terms with the past, and this has also played out in a variety of forms. At first, the framing was dictatorship versus democracy, and the issue was to build a stable de democratic society, to acknowledge pluralism, and to adhere to democratic procedure. If there was any if there were any personal voices to be heard in the 50s and beginning 60s, it was the voices of German victims. The victims of the Germans were not only largely absent in Germany, having either been killed or having fled, but they were also, but they were until the Auschwitz uh, trials eerily quiet. Only in the 70s and 80s, the question of German guilt started to frame narratives. The historian's debate of 1986 about the uniqueness of the Holocaust, as well as the reception of the Wehrmacht exhibit some years later, um, that showed how deeply the military was involved in the systematic mass killings, testified to this shift. Since the 1990s, the question of whose memory has been framing the debate being complicated by the fact of German <coughs> unification in 1990. This debate has, in a country with not too many surviving vi victims of the Nazi genocide, but with still lots of German victims, occasionally had a very strange twist. And in fact, the way the debate has been conducted in Germany and in the United States need to take it, this into consideration, that the absence of mostly Jews, but also other, other victimized population, just is, you know, they are there, but so, to such a small degree that their voices, on the one hand, are very loud, and on the other, they are very quiet. And in the United States, this debate follows very different um, paradigms. The fiercest, I mean, the fiercest textbook debates really uh, uh, revolved in the, 19, in, in the 1970s around two issues. One, and they are very diverse issues. One was the German-Polish textbook recommendations, and th the second was the epistemological crisis of historiography revolving first around social and then around women's history. In 1972, a commission of West German and Polish scholars issued recommendations on how to tell the story of German-Polish relations. That is what Michael Geyer labeled damage control, right? This was in the time of the Cold War, and regular meetings that subsequently occurred, like on a, on a yearly basis, um, were in themselves a major achievement. That's really where the achievement was in. However, in order to reach some agreement on how to speak about a tormented relationship, especially from 1939 to the post-war era, both sides had to suppress important parts of the historical truth. Thus, 
The Hitler-Stalin Pact could not be mentioned. Neither could the mass expulsion of Germans from what now were Polish lands. This triggered considerable apprehension and process from the interest groups that represented the Expellees, the Vertriebenenverbände in West Germany, and on a general level triggered a debate on whether at all and how to acknowledge the territorial outcome of the Second World War. It also brought to the fore questions whether the truth can be negotiated between bilateral commissions. Pol politics and scholarships were at times in muddy world waters in these questions. The other passionate debate um, was in the, fifth, in the 1970s is more what one would expect and it occurred in similar ways in many countries. It, emer it emerged from the challenge of national history first by social and subsequently by women's and gender history to be followed by other identity-based history. With these debates, the issues of structure versus event-oriented history and subsequently the question of whose history erupted. Um, now, if, you, if I can just give you a short example on how this played out in women's history. Now, we are, we are talking textbooks here. We are not talking uh, the question of, of um, um, like Peter Novick's book on the objectivity, that noble dream. We are talking textbooks. Now, what people would do is write their usual narrative, their national narrative, and then they would add a small paragraph on women. Now, what, does, what impact does that have? In a way, it completely reconfirms the national narrative. Because first, my daughter, when she was a teenager, would ask me, so and where is men's history? Now, <laughs> so, so I mean, that's, that's how teenagers are, right? Yeah. They, that's, and it's a completely logical question. And yeah. she had any right to ask this question, question. Now, if you take the epistemological crisis of national history um, and then it somehow makes its way into textbooks, the outcome might not be really desirable because it reconfirms. And there was, in fact, a debate between two um, historians, Barbara Duden and Annette Kuhn, in the 70s. Um, one suggesting that we should have more women's history and everyone was beaten up be, be, because you know, of neglecting women. And the other said, pointing out the epistemological problem that this would pose. Because if it is not like we heard in the morning that you know women historians have taught, have kind of brought the idea forward that every historic history is gendered, then you basically can show this much better with the traditional narrative. right? Then you can show what's missing and who are the agents. Anyway, that was just my short example. Now, Moving on, um, after 99, national history saw a brief revival in the question of how to deal with the two Germanys and how to integrate their narratives. Is there something like a normalization of national German history was the question. The question of how to deal with the Czech second German dictatorship and whether it can be to compared to the Nazi dictatorship also frames the debate for a while and continues to do so. There are all kinds of interesting things that go on around the, this question, which I can't go into. While this looking again at the now unified German nation is necessary after the enormous changes after 1989, the transnationalization of the historical narrative on low and various levels, be this European or a world historical level, is what more and more starts to frame curricula and textbook debates. And to this, I will now um, turn for the remainder of my time. Manuel Castells ended his three-volume analysis of the current world with the statement that at present, we are caught in a state of bewilderment, despite all of all our knowledge, of informed bewilderment to be sure, but of bewilderment nevertheless. A new knowledge frame that is more conducive to the ambiguities, complexities, and the unevenness of the world is needed. But this does not necessar necessarily make teaching any easier. To quote Manuel Castells, 
The promise of the information age is the unleashing of unprecedented productive capacity by the power of the mind. I think, therefore, I produce. Yet there is an extraordinary gap between our technological overdevelopment and our social underdevelopment. Which challenges does this situation of enhanced possibilities on the one hand and of dangerous unevenness on the other pose, and what are the issues that need to be addressed in education in general and in textbooks in particular? The pressure for change in school textbooks and curricula since the end of the Second World War has come from a variety of sources. First, of the increased agency of individuals. There are the increasingly authoritative rights and agency of individuals conceived as independent of and reaching beyond the national narrative. This trend correlates with the broadening of the human rights discourse and the creation of instruments to enforce individual rights within a transnational framework. Textbooks have been addressing these issues. The second point is the alternative stories and the stories of the underprivileged. The process of mass decolonization after 1945, which led to the creation of a multitude of newly independent states that now play a significant role at the international level, also contributed to an awareness and an assertion of the rights of formerly colonized people. With decolonization, peoples of Africa and Asia learned to employ European universals and to make European principles work for them in claiming their rights and identities. Like feminism, post-colonial thought has engaged those very principles, principles that were instrumental in suppression of women, of indigenous peoples, of colonized populations, in order to overcome the oppressor's ideologies. Textbooks and curricula in Germany have been slow to embrace these aspects. In order to be able to tackle these issues, a consequently transnational framework needs to be applied. While thinking about Europe clearly is on the agenda, thinking about the world seems at this point more remote. A few remarks on the European framework, which Simone Lessig has been much more thorough on. Developing a European framework for thinking about history poses its own challenges. The last century witnessed the disintegration and destructiveness of two world wars and re uh, thereafter the relative stability of the Cold War. The themes of the Cold War were heavily guarded in Europe until 1989. Since then, they have come apart and new patterns are being created. Most of the debate is about how to position the nation nowadays in Europe, in Germany, how to position the nation in a European framework. This, however, is not a convincing framework in the face of a globalizing world. In a global framework, a discourse on Europe needs to address the fundamental ambiguity of Europe's historical guilt for imperialism and the fact that many universals like human rights historically originated in Europe. And that's, a, it's, that's very diff difficult to negotiate. The provincializing of Europe and its positioning in the world has yet to take place in textbook historiography. It has only begun to change scholarship in <coughs> Germany, if at all it has scratched the surface of historical beliefs. And in fact, when the European Union tries to push a common con European consciousness, it does the exact same thing that the nation state has been doing all along, just transposing it on a, on a different level, on the next higher level. Countries in Europe and the European Union strive to create transnational loyalties and a European consciousness, which is a long-lasting process which generates much, much talking and magic thinking and very little concrete successes. In Germany, there has been, we have heard this before, talk of a European textbook, and it will have to tackle with all these questions if it will be useful in any, any, um, any uh, way at all. 
All this comes down to the question of how to position Europe in the world in the face of the dualism of historical guilt and historical chance. The, third, the fourth point is the trope of different but equal. The era of the Second World War, the era after the Second World War, has at least in some countries also witnessed the celebration and codification of cultural standards that adhere to the principle of different but equal, the right to one's own identity and otherhood. Transnational agencies such as the United Nations and UNESCO have been major promoters of this trend, although the social movements have been even more important since the 1970s. Codified as rights, identities have become important organizational and symbolic tools for creating new group solidarities and for mobilizing resources, and this is particularly true for the United States. This can be observed in the cases of civil rights, women's and gay and lesbian movements, in the surge of ethnic and regional identities and interests, and in the collective articulations of indigenous groups and immigrants. These groups, which were previously excluded from various aspects of, national, of the national collective and citizenry, have raised their voices in demanding, the, in demanding that their group narratives and identities become part of national education, among other things. The mobilization of social groups around principles of identity, new or old, progressive or regressive, have challenged the master narrative of the Western world on all fronts, and this process continues to have its impact on curricula and textbooks. For once, it created competing memories. Charles Mayer has shown in his article on consigning the 20th century to history the ways in which competing memories will have to be negotiated in the future. The two dominant narratives of the 20th century were, were what he called the Holocaust and Gulag memories. They each have their own logic. They are there and they need to be dealt with. However, the challenge of the present lies in, in alternative and especially in post-colonial narratives, and those are here to stay for a long time. It is these memories of enslavement, imperialism, and racism that are magnified through the one world that is growing together, magnified through worldwide migration processes. History textbooks have hardly even begun to tackle the questions of European guilt, of the long-lasting consequences of European imperialism, of uneven development, of ubiquitous racism and its sources. My sixth point is the question of globalization. And it's only seven points, so the end is in sight. <laughs> Democratization and liberal ideologies have been increasingly codified as globalization. The collapse of the dichotomous structure of world politics and the incorporation of the formalist socialist countries into the fold of Europe and the West in general after 1989 have played a major role in accelerating the globalization of these ideas and expanding their realm. The transformations in Southern and Eastern Europe, but also in Latin America and other parts of the world, while challenging the notions of development, modernization, liberalism, and democratization, have at the same time strongly reaffirmed these notions and strengthened their grasps, frequently using Enlightenment principles such as human rights and universalism. The Enlightenment idea of humanities has now become part of the global heritage. The stories being told thus need to embrace <coughs> micro as well as macro levels. My last point uh, is on the multiple modernities in the one world. As Michael Guy and Charles Bright have argued, the process of a globalizing world produces a world of multiple modernities and uneven yet synchronized developments. Globalization on the one hand enhances integration and on the other hand proliferates difference. New forms of inequality spring up. 
force worldization is what Manuel Castells has called these processes that privilege some and cast others into utter poverty, dependency, and ignorance. Processes that create growing numbers of people who are just not needed anymore on the labor market. These developments exclude entire regions and even continents, but they also occur within communities or between rural areas and cities. Karl Schlögel calls, actually has analyzed the metropolitan corridors that combine me, me, metropolitan areas, but the trains just go through, like between Berlin and Frankfurt and der Oder. Everything, the little stops that are being made, would lead you into a no man's land of utter insignificance. In these, in these processes, centers and peripheries at the community and global levels relentlessly attribute or withhold life chances for people. In the end, there is one world indeed, but not a world where everybody has adjusted to the same Western standards of modernity. Quote of Michael Geyer and Charles Bright, the peoples of the world are pulled into processes of global interaction and emerge resegmented and transformed in their diversity. Educators need to be aware of these processes. One wonders how far-reaching the awareness of the postmodern differences really are in schools. But one thing is clear, the mixture of class, race and gender issues that teachers face these days are obvious. And yes, class has re-entered the debate. In order not to get completely lost in these new complexities, enhanced through growing material as much as mental poverty, what is needed is to develop concepts and textbooks for a kind of basic knowledge that promotes a new consciousness that not only integrates but also transcends postmodern awareness of difference and enables students to orient themselves in a world where education might very well be part of an essential survival kit. To conclude, the current situation requires the rethinking of education and the role that history textbooks play on many levels. Education is at the forefront of a battle in which people attempt to prepare for the challenges of multiple modernities <coughs> and for an integrated world of unequal ac access, hopefully providing tools of how to navigate this world and contributing to, to creating better chances for students and future generations in general. While the nation state since the second half of the 20th century was affirmed as a universal mode of polity formation, the closure of societies and their definition as purely national collectives has become increasingly difficult to sustain, ideologically as well as institutionally. What counts as history has also changed. The epistemological crises around the questions of agency and of direction in history have revolutionized our thinking about history. And that's why Lynn Cheney can't recognize it anymore. The idea of a clear upward motion of history was discarded as Eurocentric, as were the notorious great men as the sole movers and shakers of historical development. The dominant Western narrative and construction of agency has given way to narratives of different histories with equal value, this being a much more accurate depiction of the complexities of today's world and competing views on this world and perhaps someday leading to what Michael has called entangled histories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to err on the side of shortness, given the exhaustion in the room and how much has been spoken today. I uh, Let me try, and if there will be questions, I'll be more than delighted to elaborate on that. Uh, I would start by sort of the excuse of me being here, which I'm not working specifically on textbooks. But what I am working on, and what we started four years ago, was an institute that is named Institute for Historical Justice and Reconciliation. This institute, which is an NGO, sits in administratively at Salzburg Seminar. And the goal of that institute is to bring people 
who, uh, identity-wise, uh, belong to groups that are in conflict. The groups that we've done so far, are engaged so far, include Israeli Palestinians, Polish and Jews, uh, Armenian and Turks in Uganda, and uh, the big project that Charlie has been so modest in not developing, in not describing it, because I think it is actually very crucial here, is for the former Yugoslavia. You only alluded to that, but that's. The, the notion in those projects, and we are now beginning some pro major pro other projects this uh, summer, including Northeast, uh, Ch uh, Northeast Asia and uh, India, uh, projects that I think that in, bo in all of those cases, the idea is how do you bring people who identify, however much the spectrum within the nation or within the identity is wide, but they are both recognized subjectively and objectively to belong to an identity group, how do you bring those sides to write together a shared narrative? In some respect, it is closely related to the question of textbooks and reconciliation and uh, recognition. In some others, it, there is some distance between it. So it is against that, this background that my comments are going to be, that I'm going to make my comments, and Please ask me about it more if you want, but uh, that's just by way of a very brief introduction. Um, I, I want to make three quick points in my talk. The first one is to talk about questions of epistemological and methodological concerns about writing between writing history, and we've heard a lot about the complexity of writing history, so I'm not going to rehearse all of that. But between that and the need to attend to a textbook which is a different kind of a product, which is the subject matter, my understanding of this day. So th this is about one level of, if you want construction, if you want translation of kind of language and uh, knowledge that has to be. Uh, the, se the, the second point is I want to give a couple of examples of shared narratives, and third by request uh, although that's, again, not my prime uh, work, is not in this field, is to talk a little bit by way of reporting about a couple of projects of Israeli-Palestinians who are working together and actually show the distinction and the relations between shared narrative and parallel narratives. Uh, and in, nine, in 2002, uh, Stanley Katz uh, was reported in uh, Common Knowledge to uh, present a challenge. Uh, to sort of, and he says, uh, talking about intellectuals with one front, without frontiers, and to ask how can intellectuals be involved more in the worldly events. And he said, the task is to find and fund limited, well-defined projects that will apply our theoretical training and experience to urgent problems whose full complexities have yet to be, uh, have yet gone unattended. So that was the challenge, common knowledge and at the conference, they took the challenge up. Last year, Pearl, Jeffrey Pearl reported in it in uh, common knowledge. And uh, although the IHJR has not actually produced, but we only put sort of web pages with general descriptions of methodologies and our intentions rather than our products, uh, Pearl was generous enough uh, to attend to those web pages, and he commented on it. And let me read it to you a, a paragraph I'm quoting from Pearl, and I'm taking that as the text from which I want to make the comments about uh, the epistemological comments. Quoting Pearl. My impression is that this is not talking about the IHJR. This is not an organization for scholars or about scholarship, certainly not for scholars, students of the symbolic, of the variety that Rainy da Lorraine Dustin has argued are best prepared to unpack disputes. The historians that the IHJR locks in combat to produce joint histories are encouraged to picture their conflict as between both sides. But why are conflicts thought to occur between sides at all? As though they are board games or sports. And why is it so predictably two teams and an umpire that are invited onto the field? I wonder also about the phrase historical justice in the IHJR name. Is it not an idea of historical justice dry kindling for an uncontained fire? Should historians who hope to bring peace think in terms of justice, facts, and truth? So I would like to take this commentary, which is, I bet, well meant, uh, but is not based on a lot of knowledge, as the sort of the challenge that we have of how does one engage, how do historians uh, engage in this kind 
of work. Pearl continues, if this is their aim, I would say they should concentrate in writing history on evidence of ambivalence, ambiguity, unclarity, paradox, covert agreement, and the mutual dependence of diametrically opposing claims. The problem is he sees it, and I continue to quote now, it is doubtful that historians whose methods impress, impress non-scholars, those methods tend to be positivists. That is the opposite of the symbolic or the hermeneutic are trained and poised to recognize the premises that enemies may share. Is reconciliation the likely upshot when participants in negotiation take for granted that sides are non-metaphorical, that facts are plain, and that truth and justices are causes that peacemakers are called upon to serve? So the students of the symbolic, the sophisticated scholar, as opposed to the, the positivist, the simpleton, uh, are not trained to recognize the premise that enemies may share. And uh, these enemies could not be viewed merely as two sides, as he claims, because it is too simplistic. So I think that we have to go be, to get beyond the, the claim that we have to get beyond the, two, uh, the, the notions of two sides, and that there needs to be a need to a, a shift to microhistory and even and to, to emphasize magnifying plurality. Now, I, gr I accept very much that the latter, the, the inclusions of microhistory and magnifying plurality is, is scholarly very sound, obviously. The question is, does that kind, how do we translate that, po that point, in point into what the Skidmore Conference that Pearl is reporting about uh, and claiming to have an ironic scholarship that engages real-world conflicts. Those, presumably, have to include real people who view, as we have heard all together all throughout the day, very much their groups as very real. How, how can we not ignore the idea that we have an audience, that we are part of that audience, that we have students, that we have teachers, that we have parents, that we have markets, we have gone through the day by talking about the various components that come into a textbook. Um, how can, can that be without taking into account or with, with engaging the symbolic and the plurality, but without, taking, without ignoring the positivist side? Pearl goes to Latour for his answer. Um, he quotes, all must be brought to see that facts, as their etymology, etymology indicates, are fabricated. And so are fetishes, God, values, works of art, political arenas, and nations. Here is where negotiations could begin, with the questions of a right way to build. We need to acknowledge that there exists no superior referee, no omnipotent fact or truth or historical justice, no arbitrary, able to declare that the other party is simply irrational. So effects are fabricated, recognized sides are too simplistic for conflict resolution, and there is no outside frame to adjudicate disagreements, where is one to begin? Uh, I would suggest that the, um, I promised short, so let me move. Uh, that, um, I would suggest that we move to actual practice, uh, uh, to practical solutions. And practical solutions for me is what informed us when we started the IHJR. By that we meant is what we needed to do is we needed to take groups that have a representative, a, they represent their identity, not just by, by biology or by heritage, but they represented their idea, identity by feeling belonging to the group and being part of the group yet are as close to their others as possible in bridging the group. I'll give you an example from the Israeli-Palestinian side. There has been sort of the school that in the Israeli scholarships have developed since the, I'd say mid-80s, but certainly since the 90s, are the new historians that have made. Some of the new historians, as you know, are post-Zionists. Others are, see themselves as Zionists, not as post-Zionists. 
The delineation is between who do you include in a group that, that discusses with Palestinians national reconciliation, do you include post-Zionists or don't you include post-Zionists? No doubt they are Jews, Israeli Jews who belong to them, whether the educational system, it's not about credential, it's not about the uh, quality of work, it's about the ability to represent the national point of view if you want to bring the two national points of view into a negotiation. Uh, we more or less decided, we worked with individuals in both groups, in both societies, we more or less uh, limited ourselves to those who would be otherwise called non-radicals, but more on the liberal end of the spectrum with an attempt that if we say that the, liberal, the political liberal center is where you create the meeting, you try and extend it to as much as you can to the nationalist camp. You're not going to bring the nationalists on both sides to come to an agreement, the extreme, but you may create some kind of an initial agreement. And I think that this is in terms of negotiation. The negotiation takes place. It's both political, but it is substantive. The rhetoric of history is very different than a political rhetoric. So the idea is not, I give you two massacres, and you give some expulsions and some expropriations, etc. Obviously, that can be a mockery. But on the other hand, exactly what kind of methodology? How do you focus on specific projects? How do you engage very specific a good first-rate historical work, but do what is feasible, not what is not feasible. Sorry, Elias. Does liberals mean the Zionists or the post-Zionists? In this is case, in, in this case, the post-Zionists are not included. The liberal among the Zionists, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The liberals among yeah. the Zionists who view themselves as part of the national identity. Mm -hmm. uh, can you also tell us a little bit what post-Zionism? What is a post-Zionist? Okay, sure. Just, uh, just one sentence. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it's a tough one to do it in one sentence, but basically I would say that within the, uh, within the Israeli perspective, within the Israeli national mythology, the question that Zionism is a Jewish, legitimate Jewish nationalism that ought to be maintained and keep the Israeli, Israel as primarily a Jewish state, however liberal, equality, etc., falls within the, Jew, within the um, Zionist camp. If you move to the, and this is self-definitional, okay. if you move to those who, Jews who, in Israel, who see that the component of being a Jewish state should, should be eliminated, and it should be a, city, a, a nation with a, a state without nationality that includes not only civic equality, but also national identity equality, or non-national, or transnational, or post-national. This is the post-Zionist. The post-national comes from the post-colonial and the post-national in the international conversation. There are not many who belong in that group, but they are very influential. Okay, so if we're already in here, let me move in and sort of describe a couple of the projects that I wanted to discuss. One of them is uh, actually sponsored not by us, but by George Eckert, in uh, Georg Eckert Foundation mostly. Uh, and this is a, a project that uh, is, has been going on for five years now, I believe, under an institute that is called Prime, that is headed by two by one Israeli and one Palestinian, Sami Adwan and Dan Baron. And they have been doing, this is a very interesting project for multiple levels for what we have been discussing here, primarily because they only have academic advisors, but the job is, but the work is done by teachers. Ah. It is not done for teachers, it is done by teachers. And they, the way they did it, they did it, they have, a, first of all, the a Palestinian and the Israeli group. By the way, Israeli, often, although it includes <coughs> Palestinian Israelis, is often used only obviously to describe Jewish Palest Israelis. So bear with me and if I confuse you at any moment. Uh, but in any case, there was an Israel. I don't think that in the Israeli group there, was, there were any Palestinian Israelis, but it was the Israeli group and the Palestinian group. And they first worked the teachers within themselves, then they started working together. What is unique about it, it's, it's within a conflict, it's with, at the time of a conflict, everything that we've described so much, we're talking about 1848 or some, 
literally tens of decades or hundreds of years after the conflict. This is while the, co while the conflict is going on. Um, so that is a very different pace in which it takes place. The Israelis are afraid of terror activities. The Palestinians are being harassed under occupation. So all of that to bring those people who live the conflict on their, their, in their daily life to write, it's been very difficult. Secondly, they've been it, they, they decided, interestingly enough, not to do joint narrative, but to do parallel narratives. Mm. So the book is organized in such a way that there is the Palestinian and the Israeli mm -hmm. text, and in the middle there is a f empty space for the students to interact <laughs> with the text. <laughs> now, the, the, the text is being rejected by the nationalists, by the, by the Ministry of Education, etc. It's been taught a little. It's been, it's been, it's been intellectually a fantastic success. It's been very creative. It is very good in the substance. But how far it can actually become public and large, it's more complicated. What do you mean parallel? Around similar events? Yeah, you have an event. For instance, one of the events, one of the, the first events that they deal with, well, it, I mean, I could go, but one of the events that they deal with is 1929, there were, uh, it's the second time that within the Jewish settlement in Palestine at the time that there was, and now the question, what was? There was a pogrom of Palestinians against Jews or an uprising by Palestinians against them. The, the, so what is being described? How is it being described, etc.? So you have one narrative on one side of the page, another narrative on the other, an empty space in the middle. Teachers, so you don't have the authoritative voice of, uh, of history is disappears altogether. You'll ask me more questions about it, but I'm moving to the next one. Yeah. Okay. The next one is the one that we are trying to do. It's not a textbook, but the IHR, we have the project, the Israeli-Palestinian project, and that's what we do. We have, at the moment, two very specific projects. One of them is doing an atlas of the war in 1948. So again, yeah, it is done by Palestinians and Israelis, Palestinian Jews together. It is this, it is, the maps are, are, are made together. It, it does not aim at parallel narratives. It aims at one narrative. It's going not badly. We have got, we had 80 maps. We've been doing about 60. I hope that at the end of the summer we'll be quite well. And that includes annotations of it, whether it's expulsions, whether it's battles, whether, for instance, there's one of the important battles next to Jerusalem whether it's a heroic from the Palestinian perspective, or explanations. Anyhow, there's lots of details when we get into history, obviously. But to work it together was very interesting. There's another one, which is holy sites, sites that are holy to Jews, Muslims, and oftentimes to Christians. How do you describe them together? We, have, we started with 14 sites, saying that we're not going to deal with the most controversial. The group that is actually working it included the most controversial. And they actually came up with a text, including the text for what is known as Haram el-Sharif slash Temple Mount, which is the holiest and the most controversial one. We came, the group came to the larger group to discuss it. Now go. It was not that it was not agreed whether to start in the 7th century or in the 10th century BC. It was not that the text was not agreed upon. The title couldn't be agreed upon. It would not, to have the title with a slash was too political. I mean, the fact that even from Islamic perspective, religious perspective, the Haram al-Sharif is there because it was religiously, because it was important to Jews, is not contested. The empirical evidence is not contested. The problem is that since Zionist uh, settlement, it has become so political that admitting it was, and we have had that examples earlier today in various instances where the it's not only for school children that it's the good and the truth that are in conflict, but even in terms of uh, political. So here we have quite a lot of agreement. We think of these shared narratives when they are agreed upon as building blocks. We're not going to create a situation where everyone is going to build, buy everything in it. Obviously, that would be even naive for us, and we are optimistic. But uh, I think that what it is possible is that we put out there, under joint authorship of group authorship, uh, and obviously it will not be quite as sharp as some would like, and it will have to give up some of the issues, but it will create building blocks for a joint narrative. I've gone long enough. Thank you.
Yes. <laughs> Final few words. No, thank you. I mean, it's been a very rich day. Uh, and frankly, I, mean, I must say, personally speaking, it has been so rich that I haven't found it to be tiring. Uh, because many interesting points came up. So I had, um, I actually did read um, drafts of Hannah's paper and uh, Eliezer I listened to. So in terms of my responses, perhaps there's more to say about what's gone on through the day. And I'll probably have a few things to say about uh, what you're doing, the very inspiring example of your institute. Um, <clears throat> just listen, I mean, listening to the, the day's discussion, so one of the questions that I was thinking about listening to everybody was this question that I guess we're implicitly asking ourselves is what is the work we want textbooks to do? Um, and there was a range of answers to it. And if I put the answers on a, on a spectrum, then at one extreme, was the expectation that textbooks would change subjectivity. Text, textbooks would mold you as a person, like Niladri's ambition that textbooks would make of every child a critical person, a critical thinker, to the other ex 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 extreme, which wasn't really quite articulated except as a question, uh, textbooks as a way of passing exams and getting your degrees. And obviously, sort of, you know, the reality is somewhere in between, depending on where one is talking about. But the second factor to bring into this, which Simon raised to some degree, is also the question of markets. That in the end, textbooks either have to be subsidized by the state, as in India, and even then, good textbooks, as Nilaji was saying, don't reach more than 10% of the population in India. And or they have to be marketed. And if they have to be marketed, then there's one problem that all groups, ethnic groups, identity groups face is that if their culture and demography do not constitute a market, they miss out. Uh, this is a problem in India all the time where every recognized language has hundreds of variants inside. In other words, the languages themselves have a history of oppressing other languages which we now call dialects of this language. And sometimes there are democratic points made by textbook authorities saying we should have textbooks in the dialects. But the dialect speakers are so small that it doesn't make to any economic sense to produce a textbook. Uh, so in a way, there are these problems that are around the question of textbook. And, but to think about this, think about what do we want our textbooks to do, it helps me to, um, you know, the problem of not just dialects. I mean, it's a problem that's faced by migrants. I mean, I've been party to a conversation amongst local uh, Bengalis from both Bangladesh and, and India about whether or not Bengali could be made into a school language in the US. And you run into problems of skills, you know, who will write a syllabus, do they have the credentials? There are all sorts of things which have to do with political institutions, market, where will you buy the textbooks, who will write them, who will publish them? So it, it's, a, it's a global question. The, the market question, I think, is a very important question. For Bengalis in the US? Yeah, for Bengalis in the US, yeah. And then, um, so in some ways, you know, the, the Eugene Weber's um, uh, the title, which uh, Hannah uh, uh, quoted for us, uh, reminded me of another phrase, which you know, in which one could say that what textbooks are doing are trying to, and history books are doing, are trying to convert, you know, just as peasants were being made into Frenchmen, we make pasts into histories. And it's, it's, it's. Uh, I think it's just sheer unpractical to think that histories would be the only way that people would relate to their pasts. And people imbibe from childhood on all kinds of ways of relating to the pasts, including you know, things that are mediated by belief, things that are mediated by faith, faith in grown-ups, uh, belief in my parents. Um, and these things are not ever completely displaced by secular democratic history writing that we do to produce citizens. Um, and in that sense, textbooks, you know, we, we didn't, unfortunately, this was a historian's gathering, so we didn't have either any historical or contemporary anthropology of textbook reading. So I have to, the only thing I can fall back on is my memories of reading textbooks and being produced as a citizen in independent India. And uh, not history, I'm thinking of literature, but it's a literary representation of history. A poem was written by a nationalist poet in Bengal around 1909 against untouchability. 
And it, it, the poem addresses the untouchable person as a brother and says, who calls you impure and polluted? My brother, you know, come and have a brotherly hug from me. That was the spirit of the poem. And some evenings, my mother, who was a teacher of Bengali literature, would teach me this poem as part of my homework, explain it to me, give me the emotions that I was meant to imbibe from the poem, against emotions against untouchability, to know that the caste system was bad. And the next morning, just as my mother would sit down to have her meal before going to her school to work, the untouchable person who cleaned the toilet in the house would turn up. And my mother would immediately remove all the curtains from his way so that he didn't touch any curtains. <laughs> you know, she would get us out of his way, and he, with a sort of you know, a broomstick and a bucket in hand, would go straight to the toilet to clean it. Now, imagine an ideal time in which this untouchable person and my mother and myself, if you could belong to the same generation, and if Nilaji was the prime minister of the country. Uh, imagine a time in which we'd all been through the schools that Nilaji had set up, and these were the only institutions that molded our subjectivity, and the three of us met as critical thinkers, and we would have nothing to be critical about. Because we would all have the same points of view. We would all relate to each other from similar points of view. So there's an interesting problem. I think in, in some ways, therefore, that's why the extreme of thinking that my textbooks will mold subjectivities for me, it's part of a totalitarian imagination. You know, even to make the demand that everybody will be a critical thinker, I often felt that I was very, very fortunate my parents weren't critical thinkers. Um, so that I often, because often what I write in English, because of the very idiomatic nature of English, comes out as irreverent if translated direct into Bengali. Irreverent of my traditions, my elders, my, and my parents, you know, they were educated, but very wisely, never looked at the contents of what I wrote. They felt very proud of the fact that I wrote. They would show the book to the grocer in the neighborhood. My son has written a book. Nobody took an interest in what was written in the book. And that allowed me a certain kind of freedom to move about in the world, you know, where I write something else in Bangla, which they will read, and I write differently in English, for I write for a different audience. And in that sense, I think one has to place textbooks into this I mean, textbooks must not be a way of homogenizing. Um, you know, uh, even if textbooks present clashes of points of view, they must not be, we must, we can't think of a point that everybody must occupy, or even that everybody should occupy in relating to points of view. In other words, the world is a dangerous place, and textbooks can't render it safe. Secondly, I want to say then that but I actually think the debates about textbooks are really important. Why they're, I mean, if you think about it, if my position is right, then you see the interesting thing about textbooks, it seems to me, is that textbooks are usually, debates about textbooks are usually carried out over the heads of the people who are going to read the textbooks. Normally. I mean, even Nilaji made a valiant experiment where the, he actually involved students in discussing uh, draft textbooks. This normally doesn't happen in the production of textbooks in India. But debates do take place. And these debates, I think, are, they are actually about, they restate the ideals of democracies we're living in. So I actually think they're intra-elite debates. And they are, in some ways, about rewriting, renegotiating, depending on the situation one is in, rewriting, renegotiating the social contract that we imagine as holding our society together around certain new agreements and new prohibitions. You know, there could have been a different social contract which was made up of certain set of agreements and prohibitions. We want to change them. And I think what is very important in democracy is to fight for the safety of this space where we can actually struggle as historians, as professionals, to keep alive this space where we actually debate the social contract as we live it out. But, but it does not mean necessarily that this will directly translate into the production of subjectivity. I and mean, one of the most interesting things in India is that uh, because of Indian democracy and because marginalized castes have been drawn and, and politically energized, drawn into the Indian electoral process and politically energized by the electoral process, there's a phenomenal rise in the demand for pasts which I've also seen in the Australian context amongst Australian Aboriginals. Maoris in New Zealand have gone through this. And, and what you find, what I, what I find very striking when I look at it, is that the demand for pasts 
does not translate into a demand for textbooks written by academics. It actually often is a demand for more myths that will make this ex-marginalized people feel proud of themselves. Um, it, it, it translates, and here I think you know, there's some reverberation of your work. For instance, I mean, there are New Zealand historians, Miranda's just left, and Summons, two histories. New Zealand historians have been experimenting for a while with trying to bring different kinds of histories together. In fact, John Pocock has a very interesting essay in the New Zealand context on this question. One of the interesting demands that has come up in the Australian context from Aboriginal and pro-Aboriginal historians is to, you know, every place where there is a statue of an Australian explorer, which is a tribute to the settler colonial narrative, to have a statue to Aboriginals killed by the settlers. Now, you know, it's, it's beyond the textbook, but it is about reconciling Absolutely. history. It is about shared past, and, but kind of acknowledging the conflict that also makes up the shared past. So it seems to me just to, you know, um, I, don't know, I don't want to prolong this, but just to uh, finish up and make two or three points. It seems to me that, um, that why, I mean, these processes and what we do in the textbooks are not mutually uh, exclusive. And sometimes one can overlap, but I'm simply trying to say that it's probably good, good to ask ourselves this question, what practically do we want our textbooks to do for us? And, and not to have extremely totalizing you know, either only to pass exams or to completely mold subjectivity, not to have those two extremes as our imagination. But having said that, let me say uh, where I think, um, Hannah talked about EU, and a lot of stuff that you said about EU resonated with what Nilaji was talking about this morning. And I think Michael's point, which was a very important point he made this morning, I thought, which is a distinction between, say, a country like Japan, which was a nation even before it became an empire, um, and a nation like India, which is a product of an empire, um, and still has an imperial structure. I mean, there are still people like the Nagas who felt who have been forcibly drawn into the nation. And there is there the, the whole question of how do you accommodate diversity in the production of the textbook is very important. And interestingly, I think you mentioned it, and it came up in questions of uh, Central Europe. And from my own personal experience in talking to people to the east of Central Europe, people from Russia, Ukraine, all over those regions. I mean, the interest in post-colonial uh, stories are fascinating because they are also trying to imagine multiple Europes. And again, within Europe, you again have now have different imaginations of Europe from the extreme of fortress Europe, right, to other kinds of inclusive Europe. But what's fascinating, even when you look to a liberal, um, left intellectual who I respect, otherwise very much like Etienne Balibar, trying to talk about European immigration. Balibar ha feels obliged to construct a very positive, radical tradition as Europe, right? which is not fortress Europe, against fortress Europe. But suddenly, he's drawing on what is only partial Europe, uh, uh, and a history of being open. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I once said to him, why call it Europe? I mean. Why would you still want to call it Europe when, and you know, there wasn't a clear answer to it. But, and, but speaking to me, it always reminds me that, um, since we're about Europe and history, that there was one very important post-colonial intellectual, Franz Fanon, who believed in Europe in the sense that he has this wonderful sentence at the end of The Wretched of the Earth where he says, all the ingredients for the emancipation of human beings are available in European thought. But the only way we can use them is by forgetting history. I mean, which is a very interesting position of actually being a Europeanist, being from the colonies, and seeing the path ahead as, as one where you have to actually have to forget history. And because it's such an, again, such an extremist thought that his, his thought, as you know, becomes a thought about implosion. And he has to use violence eventually as some sort of redemptive metaphor for what that transformation would mean. But at the same, but today, I mean, let me end by making these two points. One is that hist historians' response to globalization at the level of writing textbooks, at the level of framing courses, level of writing articles that like Michael has done, and we, we all have done, is to really get interested in world history and transnational history, connected history. These are the terms that have come up. And world history has taken a different, interesting, different collocation. Like when Nehru wrote letters called Glimpses of World History, world history stood for internationalism. 
Now world history stands for being connected, uh, global processes. But when I think about it, I think that this is going to be supplemented at least in the next few decades by something else, which uh, in order to explain which, I'll, let me coin two terms and explain those and finish what I have to say. When I look at European thought from the Enlightenment on, I find one kind of thinkers whom I, in my head called, these are people who are celebrants of the species. You know, they write ultimately histories of, optimistic histories of how wonderful this species is, the human being. And Kant, Hegel, Marx are my exemplars of that. That in the end, this, this species will bring something good. They'll bring some paradise on earth. And you have other kinds of thinkers, European thinkers, whom I think of in my head as species anxious. They're anxious about the species. Malthus is one of them. There's always this anxiety whether will capitalism finish the species off? And given the environmental uh, talk that is now being taught by the U last UN report and everything, if global warming really persists in the way that it is, that scientists are saying it will, if the sea levels rise, then one of the things we face in the next three or four decades, in my region of the world where I come from, that one third of Bangladesh will go underwater. If one third of Bangladesh goes underwater, the people will come to India. Because some of India will also go underwater. What sort of histories will we write? Goes back to Michael's question. And, I, and it seems to me that at some point, we will have to go even beyond world history and transnational history and connected histories and begin to think of species history um, um, in order to actually write histories that are adequate to what looks like the coming crisis of the 21st century. You know, the environment has proven to be the most effective critique of capitalism and the industrial way of life. So, thank you. Well, we move on to debate. I'm quite sure we would. We have 20, 30 minutes. OK, Jake. Excuse me, I have two comments. Um, the first one is uh, we've heard a lot, almost all the presenters talked about how uh, these uh, nationalist narratives and textbooks have been used to mobilize the nation against internal and external others. Um, but we haven't really talked about uh, another use of these nationalist narratives, which was, which was uh, also extremely important, which is to uh, you face economic inequality and repress class conflicts. And um, from what I've heard about the sort of emerging transnational and multicultural alternative to the old nationalist narratives, it doesn't seem that, it seems that the new narratives are doing the same thing. And I think that, at least in the case of China, that's very clear. Because the, this new Shanghai textbook um, removes the uh, Maoist, Maoist era uh, glorification of class conflict um, in, the, in the interest of, of creating a harmonious, so-called harmonious society um, at, at a time when class conflict is currently very high in China. So um, while I, I agree with the, uh, the goal of, of encouraging pluralism through, through, uh, through our use of textbooks, um, I think we also have to ask ourselves uh, how meaningful pluralism is in a context of radical economic inequality. And uh, my second comment is <coughs> that all the countries we've talked about in the last 30 years have gone through uh, free market structural adjustment. And I wonder if we can use that as an explanatory uh, variable in, in uh, understanding how um, both in the creation of these transnational narratives and in the sort of uh, resurgence of, of, of nationalist narratives in, uh, say, in the American case of the Japanese case as, uh, as a means of dealing with the social consequences of, of the neoliberal reforms of the last century. Can I pick this up, if you don't mind? Because uh, this is one thing I'm, I'm actually sitting at at the moment in this last chapter of this global history uh, I'm writing, uh, which is on the period post 1970s to the present. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
we've radicalized the statement you've quoted uh, on, on the re-emergent or reproduction of difference uh, quite uh, dramatically in the sense that we now systematically reinsert uh, class as an issue. But the problem is class is still part of a functional universe of, of economic division of labor. As such, it's ex extremely important because uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you can indeed uh, uh, locate inequality. But the problem of inequality is really way beyond that because you have entire pop people or populations really that are not in this interconnected, interactive uh, uh, and, and deeply divided and unequal whole. They are outside, so I mean the question is how do you, uh, and they are barely connected or actually thrown out and this happens both in the metropole as well as in uh, in the various new peripheries, uh, and the question is, what do you, what do, you, how do you, how how do you cope with this kind of uh, population, with these kinds of people? They are your Bangladeshis, in as much as they stay in Bangladesh, rather than go to Singapore and work where they are part of our class society, and as, as such, very easy to handle. Well, not easy, but they are. We, I can handle them, you know, as a, as a historian, I can deal with that kind of population, remittances and everything. But the populations that are flushed out uh, and, and effectively... Who, who are you talking about? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, a whole group of Africans, uh, uh, entire groups of African societies, which are effectively disconnected from any kind of uh, interactive ex uh, uh, in the, the neoliberal exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, that have, uh, that if they participate in the global economic or information structure, they are uh, effectively only participating through charity or they, uh, they, they participate through very indirect means. Uh, and uh, not in any case being part of that global division of labor that uh, that produces one part of the of the global world so what do you do i mean how 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 you integrate those populations into a history into a global history that effectively excludes them but michael if you i mean, i'm just really i'm, very I'm just thinking that if, if if some of these societies are results of, let's say, you know, World Bank or IMF induced structural adjustments and things of that sort. Why could, I mean, like, say, say the African mineral belt, where there are many sort of societies have unworked recently. Um, uh, Sierra Leone is one case in point, right? Um, so warlordism well, based on a diamond based economy. You basically right? then extracted, you have, you, you have you, you and multinational companies have been involved in Nigerian places. The oil companies have played a role. So what I'm asking but, is, but in Sierra Leone, it, that is a very selective part of uh, a, a very selective part of the country. Now it's a highly coveted part of the country. Hence, it is uh, fought over uh, and it's fought over by various people. But that is, uh, you know, at best 10 percent uh, of that population, and the, the disconnect to the rest. Is I don't see your problem, Michael. Yeah, I don't see your problem. Look, if we're talking about any kind of global incorporation process, it's always. There are always people at the margins, and it's always the case that uh, global processes are continuing to encompass. They don't ever get to everybody. And uh, I, I mean, I'm, this is perfectly a perfectly legitimate situation in which we can continue to apply the uh, the categories of inequality, uh, even if we can't easily apply formal class categories. So I think we can see another kind of inequality uh, uh, operating at the margins. Uh, but if your if your main agenda is the is the globalization one, well, well, we got quite a lot to talk about yeah. within that, no, no. and then to talk about those who are, I mean, it's not that the system isn't continuing to expand. Of course, it is. It hasn't reached everybody. Simply well, no, 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 no. Uh, there I disagree so with you because no, it's it's incorporate, it the incorporation yes. also excludes, right. and yeah. I think 
as opposed to previous stages of incorporation, where the exclusion simply produces parallel society that are uh, relate to the global society in, in a disconnect or in some kind of subaltern, in, in, a, in yeah. a global subaltern position. What you have is actually the, Sierra Leone is a good case, the actual destruction of that other society. You basically have super, superfluous people who, mm -hmm. but can I exist? Uh, ask what, what is the issue? I mean, is it that you that these people uh, sort of fall out of the radar of uh, possible scholarly knowledge? Is that what you're asking? Well, I think they fall out of the radar radar of survivability. That seems to me the danger at the moment. Uh, but that. Okay, so that's the issue. So then, is that that different from the increasing uh, sort of stratification in American service society, right? Where, where, with, when you did have unions and working class and so on, there was much more. But now, of course, now you see service people at two complete ends, mm -hmm. and they've also pretty much yeah. fallen out. No, I, I mean my effort was to cope with uh, Jake's question, uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, what I tried to answer is uh, that is that is a problem I do have yeah. concretely. The problem is I can't deal with highly strategized, yeah. so, uh, uh, stra stratified society yeah. that stratify over huge distances. Yeah. That I think you have to learn how to do that, yeah. but I think that, that is possible. Yeah. What I have a hard time to deal with yeah. is societies about whom we were happy about 20, 30 years ago, the kind of authentic societies outside of the system which I now uh, see increasingly as the completely endangered societies, that is their survivability is in danger. <coughs> and since this is a good part of, uh, certainly a good part of Africa, it would have that kind of yeah, I was just society at the I mean, edge of survival would be right. a part of, or would have to be part of that history. And that, I mean, obviously it is often dealt with as a natural history, you know, in terms of, you know, Bangladesh uh, right. going underwater, but I think it is it is actually a political history rather than uh, and a social history rather than a natural history of these populations. Uh, what Hannah Arendt called okay. superfluous uh, yeah. no, populations. I, I have a quick, but we can come back. Yeah, yeah. Um, responding to the question of you know uh, economic dimension to the textile context, I just uh, can't tell other countries, but in the Japanese case, uh, nationalists always attack the, you know, the description of labor movement, description of uh, the division of poor and wealthy. So they, you know, the, we focused on the uh, war memory issues, but there's always a nationalist. Uh, there are uh, the targets of nationalist attack included uh, economic dimension to it. And uh, the, the epoch we raised in 1955, 1955 uh, 79, and 1995, actually uh, sort of the, in, in a, uh, different ways we interpreted it's uh, the three moments. Um, at that point, Japan had some economic issues to, to deal with. So uh, that is not, not, to me, it is not a coincidence, but at the same time, uh, Mark and I have talked about it over uh, <laughs> several weeks and months, you know, but we just didn't include it in, in our paper. Uh, so just a quick week to talk about 1955 and the next year, 1953, actually the Japanese government uh, announced that uh, there is no longer a uh, post-war. Uh, so it is the beginning of Japanese economic miracle or economic, uh, Japanese uh, recovery from the post-war economy. And the 1970s or 1980s is a basically the moment where when uh, Jap Japanese internal uh, market reached the maximum. Although Japan was able to expand its economy in terms of uh, external uh, economy, it basically uh, Japanese companies uh, expanded or you know, still more shifted its emphasis into the external market. And actually in 1990s, actually uh, the, the reach of Japanese companies uh, 
in the e external market reaching a sort of maximum also. So it's a sort of three a model in the economy I'm it. I'm not sure about the, to explain it in terms of structural adjustment, but certainly I think it is a useful framework to understand it. Uh, it is mean, meaning that you know, economic dimension in the fixed patterns is obviously uh, a useful dimension. Although we haven't uh, really gathered the empirical evidence to do that, so it's still a sort of theory. Oh. Yeah. I'm not sure this is going to make much sense. But over the course of the day, and I think especially with some of the comments, including this last one, um, about the um, globalization and the, the margins, it seems to me one of the things we haven't much talked about, the word came up a few times, and that is citizenship. And, and it seems to me rather important that one of the things that's getting lost in historiography as well as in life is citizenship. Identity is multiple yes. and diverse. Citizenship is at least allegedly, at least formally equal and, and same. So these histories, if they're to make citizens, have to do a lot of forgetting. Uh, this was Renan's point in 1882 when he talked about what is a nation. And somehow, not that I want to advocate this, but um, it, it, it seems like there is something inherent uh, in the nation that requires this forgetting. Uh, and, and maybe um, the other side of that is, though, that as we move outside of the nation, we lose the resource of citizenship, which is a huge loss, it seems to me. Um, and, and that, if there were citizenship, there would be some way to connect these, these people. We are not going to world citizenship. This is what uh, the, the whole point about the European Union, what they are able to do or not, except so far this is not helping the most marginal folks who are within the European region now. And I, it's only a few years, who knows what happens. Anyway, I do think that there is an issue that citizenship runs through this thing both within the nation and outside of the nation, and it's a dilemma in both places. But Perhaps just to com a comment on it, I think that the tension between citizenship and the nation is something that has been so strong in the 20th century. I mean, we have, we have touched it on multiple ways. I'm not talking outside the state. I'm talking within the state, not the, multi, not the, your, the EU na 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 citizenship, but the issues of minorities, the issues of groups, the issues of group rights. All of that is very, it's a crucial tension within it. And I think that much of what we've been doing here, um, talking about it, has a very direct relationship to that. Uh, so, I mean, the way that you write, whether it's within the nation, or, I'm sorry, within the state, including and forgetting, or whatever it is, that's exactly the subject matter of that, whether we talk about, I mean, I can make a whole list of what we've done today, whether it's Germany and the expellees or the various kind of st states within Central Europe or the Middle East, wherever you go, the tension is between those two things and the, and the history books, even more, the textbooks, even more than the historical work, which the individual historians work, but the textbook actually is a very good manifestation of that. It's a mirror of what is synthesized by the amorphous group at that moment. I guess all I would say, though, is that citizenship, I agree with your description. Right. But it seems to me that the formal quality of citizenship confers a claim. Absolutely. Yeah. And the tension between that claim and the nation yeah. is at the core of what, right. much of what we discussed. Oh, I absolutely yeah, agree I, with you. Yes. And no. I, think, I think this is also the sort yeah, of no, fine. the criticality, the, the sort of the leftist, the cosmopolitan vision is in fact a citizen vision, as opposed to the more uh, you know narrowly construed uh, nationalist claims, and which is to it. Isn't there an interesting um, difference here between the claim that the individual makes to the state, and that is, I think, the claim of citizenship, and it's based on the constitution. And on the other hand, the nation's claim on the individual, especially in the case of conscription, if yeah. you have to uh, go to war, and if you have to make a really total commitment, including self-sacrifice. 
So in order to um, enable a person to make a claim, you know, accept the claim of a nation, uh, you have to have some mobilizing you know, element in, in, you know, in this whole input. And if, if, uh, usually this is uh, where the national narrative comes in, the pride and the yeah. values and so forth. This is, this, these are two really conflicting you know, tensions that uh, sort of um, Make up the nation. I think before. And I think this is <laughs> one of the dichotomies between this East and Western European um, uh, problem that that we have in, uh, in Central Europe, Eastern Europe. We talk a lot about uh, ethnic nationalism um, and uh, constitutional nationalism. Um, I think that that in the West, and I include the whole West European progeny. Um, there is the acceptance, at least by elites, that citizenship is, is blind as far as ethnicity, ethnicity, religion, culture, whatever, although there are pressures certainly within those countries not to make that broad definition. In Eastern Europe, what I see is a much more, a much greater legitimacy idea of saying you have to be part of our national group really to have bestowed upon you all the real rights of citizenship. You well, I, I just think that this is what Charlie says is presumably true in a very segmented and specific period, primarily in the post-war period during the Cold War. I think that first of all, once you, expo once you start including the immigrants in, in Western Europe, that falls by the wayside, that the issue of what is the nation and the citizens, that doesn't work anymore. Doesn't it? The pressure is there, certainly, to make well, I, I, well, okay. I mean, at the moment, that's exactly the tension between having a nation and a, what does it mean being one or another. I mean, that's exactly the tension at the moment in Western yes. Europe. What you say now? We have uh, yeah. Yeah. quickly. Yeah, exactly. You first. <laughs> Just wanted to say, and you come in going, any time you want. <laughs> <laughs> going back to the Renan essay. Yes. Um, it does seem to me that, that while he is talking about the national amnesia that's needed, but from what I, what I see and what I've read, it seems to me that the, that the amnesia actually is about, not about society forgetting, but society remembering in such a way that it does not impinge on the construction of public life, a common public life. And you know, so in India there are many cases where Hindu-Muslim conflicts are recited literally sung or recited in such a way that it's not immediately feeding into a law and order problem or a making for a riot, but it's an everyday affair. But, but you see, you know, the societies have ways of archiving mm -hmm. those memories well, and, 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 and they retreat in, at particular points. So I'm just saying that-, that I think that is what he has right, in right. Mind. So that If you call it complete forgetting exactly, then, or forgetting in a right. certain way. Right. But that's why it's um, a, or remembering it. But that's why the way. citizenship is a pertinent point. It's about the public-private distinction. Yeah. See, that's why it seems to me that so long as, I mean, it, I think it's anti-human to think that human beings will be without prejudice in a Gadamerian sense, right? But, but the problem is, what do we do with prejudice in public life as we live together? I just wanted to sort of uh, uh, bring this issue to the whole issue of Europe that, uh, that our uh, Europeanist colleagues uh, were bringing up, which is that I'm not at all sure that the kind of uh, region that they're trying to create in Europe is similar to, to nationalism. In fact, it may be uh, more similar to in fact, the multinational state in some ways, and, uh, and both its failures and success in the sense that you have, because in, in a sense, the nationalist apple has been bitten, right? And it's not going to be easy to, to sort of get out of those. On the other hand, is, it, is, it, is what the European project, one of trying to relocate citizenship at the higher level, right? And then so you get this sort of divergence. I mean, this also has, I do agree, this has to be seen in its uh, economic dimension and the changes in the nature of capitalism and all of these kinds of things. But politically, is that the model that uh, do you, I just wanted to get a sense, yeah. Well, I, you opened up an interesting question about with the citizenship issue. Um, part of what's going on, whether it is on the globalizing level or on the Europeanizing level is that the nation state needs to be rethought and that, that is exactly what citizenship is about. And we are not 
interested in dissolving citizenship. But what do we do, for example, with illegal immigrants? Mm -hmm. When we, I mean, we all would yeah. like to try to school the children. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't have citizenship rights. They, even their, their status is very insecure and they could be expelled. But there is a human right to education. Yeah? So we ask the nation state to reinforce yeah. a universal human right which at the same time underma undermines its citizenship notion. Yeah? So this is, this is, I think, are the issues that we are dealing with on some level. So it is really also about a repositioning of the nation state as an intermediate be between universalisms and particularities. And that's the good version. I mean, Jan Sialonka <laughs> uh, effectively yeah. interprets uh, the new European space as an imperial space, except mm -hmm. that he can't quite define the imperialist. What he is right about is certainly the Eastern European perspective that argues what we get is a whole system of norms, of regulations, of laws that define what we can and cannot do and that are the principle that are the the, 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 the the precondition for our admittance to reasonable uh, chance of well-being that is part of that uh, European economic community so which is tied indeed to a number of norms now of course what Zilonka doesn't quite argue is that indeed uh, the, the, the main norm is and the most effective norm is is the human rights norm, uh, which has been strengthened over the last fifteen years quite considerably. Although it's 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 pretty, you know, it has huge holes in it, but still it is there, and that is an interesting potential because it gives rights of personhood right. rather than uh, which is of yeah. course Yasmin's or Yasmin Soysa's mm -hmm. old idea, which didn't quite pan out then, but now does in a way. Yeah. It gives rights of personhood mm -hmm. where citizenship no longer quite uh, kind of uh, grasps uh, people because I mean at this point you have millions uh, of people certainly in France but everywhere else as well that are who are not citizens and yet ought to have rights. But, but think of the etymology of citizen, which is nothing to do with nation, right? Yeah, it's yeah. from the city, so that why cannot we? Why can't it be expanded to the to the species? Well, I mean, but I think these these two guys have had a yeah, hand up a long, yeah. for a long time. Mauricio, I think you, Mauricio you want to speak time. to this yeah. issue, and then Nilazi, you want to speak. Something yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Maurice. One, one, one uh, two comments. Uh, the first is that I think that the uh, I, I, I brought about the issue of citizenship of, uh, uh, very strongly, although it was not, um, maybe it was not uh, very clear that this is precisely what I was talking about. Uh, taking yeah. what you seem to be, all the Europeans here seem to be very sort of ambivalent about Europea and everything. First of all, Keep in mind two things. Uh, yes, from Germany or from Central Europe or the new commerce to the European Union, things look different. From Spain, it looks completely different. It looks a very successful story, which now is beginning to have the bad, the bad side, which is immigration, which is exactly the same problem that Germany and everything. But in terms of citizenship, in terms of equality, uh, I believe since uh, Charles V of Germany, uh, for the first time, Spain is really accepted as a world leader, and Portugal the same. And so, it is, it is successful, and this citizenship is a very important issue uh, to keep in mind. Whatever happens in the future with the European Union, uh, this is a very interesting example. Europe doesn't have to be a geographical location, a well-defined historical entity. It has to be that intellectual, so to speak, which is now in the minds of my generation and younger generation of Erasmus kids in Europe, in Spain and Portugal, which they don't really know what it is, but it's good. And it's good not only because it concludes citizens' rights, it includes a lot of money to develop. A money that was never invested, and I go to my other case, in Mexico. There has never been a Marshall Plan for Mexico. There has never been an European reconstruction plan as Portugal, Greece, and Spain for Mexico. And nevertheless, to go back to your point, Mexicans have done that. 
died for the nation, for the United States. In all the wars of the United States, Mexicans are here, and we can not think of a common citizenship. Doesn't matter the nationality, doesn't matter the ethnicity, we Mexicans are all adverts. We are not going to force anybody to speak Spanish or anything. We are used to these crazy things. We are just asking for our good Ferdinand II to come back, uh, Ferdinand II to come back. Just, you know, multiple societies in which we are not going to just belong to the same clusters with the same rights of the king and God. Well, the nation, this empire, they just have this citizenship issue in which these guys, Mexicans, have been so much apart. Dying, even dying, and not citizens. It's, it, it is a very important uh, example of how uh, even the European Union being with all this failure, a very good example of how this is even unthinkable in, this, in the case of the United States. And my final comment, if Professor Chakravart is going to be the first mammal intellectual, <laughs> I want to be with him. I don't want to be either the mestizo, the Mexican, or the American. I want to be with him. It's uh, only partly to do with this, but it's a conversation with, uh, you know, the patients at certain points, and I think it's uh, in, important to address one central question which he's raising about uh, um, uh, deciding what this textbook wants to do and the point about criticality. Now, I, I think what we need to recognize is that textbooks can, as you were saying, textbooks uh, can never uh, actually um, influence everyone uh, and incorporate, uh, um, you know, uh, take uh, provide versions of the past and ways of relating to the past which displaces other ways of relating to the past. That's something which we must recognize and that is something which nationalist historians any, everywhere in the world in the past did not recognize. I think we have to begin with that assumption. It's not just begin with an assumption that there are limits to what we are doing, but also possibly, uh, as you mentioned, and I fully agree there, possibly recognize there is a value to other ways of relating to past. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, because these ways of relating to past, whether through myths, through stories, through um, uh, local memories, through community, through religion, these are, uh, through other religion, yeah. these actually socialize people into other communities. And uh, citizenship or one way of being is uh, should not necessarily displace, displace other ways of being. Yeah. Therefore, uh, I fully agree there that uh, there, there should the word, be the yeah. ambition of any text uh, should not be to displace all other texts. That would, that's I'm completely opposed. Displace other forms of uh, relating to the past, other forms of constituting communities, other forms of um, defining relationships, and there. These, that is will be the part of, uh, part of that multiple ways of being which should be part of uh, and that's why uh, the question is not simply I think citizenship it should be also community what can, how do we constitute why we think what are the ways of thinking about um, productively thinking about uh, con um, you know uh, um, acceptable ways of constituting communities and problematic ways of constituting communities that's something Can I go back to something that Simone actually raised, and I think Hannah's paper also included, which is the tension between the question of formal citizenship, which, and there's very interesting European discussions about precisely to do with whether refugees can be considered part citizens, you know, grading citizenship in some ways, but still it's a formal connection to the state. The question that Simone was raising is the whole question of belonging. I mean, how do you, pr in other words, would European Union mean also uh, a different way of belonging. And that's the question you were raising with respect to textbooks. And, and I think that is a, a, see, so there again, obviously we all allow for multiple belongings. And what I was trying to communicate through, trying to think about through this sort of species history, is that when we, are, when we write histories of real crisis, right, crisis that affects us all, and affects us all as species, like if there's going to be, I mean the projection is that in 30 or 40 years, two billion human beings are going to go without water. Right? And this is for a, for a creature that 60-70% of whose body is made up of water. Right? Now that's a disaster that faces us all. And I think at that level, for me the, the intellectual challenge is, you know, 
the only way we have thought about finitude, Heidegger included, is to the individual. In other words, this, the whole phenomenology of finitude is to do with the individual's inmost impossible experience of death. But can we think of the finitude of the species? In other words, can we extend that philosophical idea to actually thinking about the species? I mean, Hegel or Marx didn't think that. You know, I mean, when you think of them, the species of the finitude was nowhere on the horizon. The religions did. The religions have tried to think about it because religions relate to human condition, and some of these environmental crises bring the human condition to the fore. I mean, that's something like bare life or barely human in Agamben's world. And it, it's really how does one write histories of those, uh, histories that are looking to those moments where the belonging is neither European nor Indian, you know, it, it is, but it's already happening. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that water will replace oil as the most scarce resource and the most important resource. And I wouldn't be surprised if in 40 years nations are fighting this war. Is, this water. is an interesting take on Mauricio's Absolutely. mixing water and oil. Right. And, and now I've mixed them. <laughs> and, and the fact that, I mean, this is, you know, this is what you were saying. This is not recognized. The reality of the actual commonality of US. And, uh, and, the, and the commonality of us is, you see, the, the global crisis is actually bringing us more together. But what we do here levels. is to reinsert a fundamentalism or a transcendental element, a new totality, in this case, the totality okay. of potential, uh, uh, potential yeah. liminality of the species, okay. right? And that is indeed the, the transcendental. Yeah. Uh, but it's that, that coming back differently. Really. That in, we have to try to avoid at all costs right. in our history. The right. question is whether we should. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem is, you're, 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 I think your argument doesn't quite pan out because, of course, the survivability not of species but of nations is very much at the center of very much all of the this. thinking of the 19th and 20th century. And it has done a tremendous amount of damage yeah. Uh, yeah. in thinking nationally. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, but, uh, no, I just think that there's a lot of, I mean, obviously these are very crucial questions, but the, I think that in terms of when we're talking about textbooks and nations, the, the, the conflicts are much more local, or not local in the sense they are, they are, they are regional, whatever the place, yeah, yeah. it's more specific and identity. The people, Some crises are, absolutely, and, but there are other coming crises which yeah. will not be local. Absolutely, but, that, but in terms of the kind of... Anna. Yeah, you do the final word. Oh, uh, I'm really pleased that we have such a lively discussion at the end of a, d of a very interesting <laughs> day. I think it's great. I'm really intrigued by it. I don't have a final comment. I leave that to the organizers. Tegu wanted to make a point, but it has to be very quick, I think. Right, Michael? But I still think, oh, we did not pay enough, enough attention to the role of our history textbook. And what are the interests against it? More, 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 more importantly, right? Well, to give my answer to that, uh, in 1947, when I was born, uh, in the, at the southern edge of Germany, uh, at least my family very much still thought that the best thing for us would to become Swiss. <laughs> I effectively agree with that, much as I think uh, in the in a, in a certain variant of southern German thinking that the real unification of Germany would be with northern Italy rather than 
On that note. On that note, please. It's Michael's personal view. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kind of verse. Is, uh, yeah. But uh, it's all local, right? <laughs> Very clearly. Uh, the problem of bridging these uh, these huge gaps that have opened up, in this case, the Swiss just didn't want us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> How about if we all become Swiss? Yeah. <laughs> they would not know that either. I don't think they would have to subsidize too much. But is it, the is point is, uh, in Switzerland, yeah, I, I, I had to be embraced easily. 11 months, uh, uh, what you reminded me of, and what I kind of spoke rather negatively about at the beginning, uh, and then the, the kind of damage control <laughs> history. I think we need a we lot should. of damage control, yeah. and uh, much as uh, my family was pro-Swiss, it was also pro-French. Right. Uh, <laughs> and I think uh, uh, that kind of damage control was the first necessary step of overcoming what had been an alienation uh, that was very temporary. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was really, Came out, there is an older history of really pro French and pro Napoleonic sentiment out of which this particular family comes, right? But uh, uh, overcoming that, uh, it needed in the first instance kind of the kind of simple textbook damage control that prohibited, as it were, the most extreme kinds of national histories. And that set in motion a process in which then, uh, I mean, at the, at the end of which then Niladri's vision for an Indian history is. I mean, that seems to me a really wonderful vision. Uh, it seems to me it uh, would be, if, if you, if we could import you to Europe, uh, you should write the text for Europe, including Spain and Portugal. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, uh, some yeah. people have At to go. Point, so yeah. I think we have yes. to, some people. Uh, thank, you to thank you to all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Uh, very nice to meet you. Uh,